again. I am thankful that we are here together and, and that we've dodged a, a bullet with Isaias going that way, that, whatever way, uh, but continue to pray for people on the East Coast as they, uh, they may be seeing that. Boy, it's been a year, right? Murder hornets, uh, strange seeds coming in the mail from China, and then the pandemic, the economic shutdown, riots. Uh, it's, it's difficult times. I, I feel like uh, we are seeing so much packed into one year, and we, we all know this. I don't need to keep talking about it. Uh, but sometimes I, I just kind of want to give up. <laughs> I just want Jesus to return and have this all be over. Uh, I don't know if you've ever felt that way, or, or maybe you just want to check out and move to an island or something. I, I, these are thoughts that go through my head as we encounter these difficult times, and I, I feel like maybe it's just kind of human to think that way. I hope I'm not alone, but, uh, but, but Hebrews, as we continue in Hebrews 3, <clears throat> the author wants us uh, to not really think that way. Uh, in, in fact, he wants us, as we face difficult times, to, to endure, to persevere, maybe even to, to flourish, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, as we look at Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be reading uh, Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. So if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, that's where we'll be. Let me go ahead and read from God's Word this morning. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one Who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So as as we've talked about in the first few chapters of of Hebrews, this is a community uh, that we don't know a lot about, but we do know that they have a Jewish background, and and we do know that they, they suffered. They suffered at least through false teaching creeping into the church, And we also know for sure that they suffered economic persecution. If you were to flip over to Hebrews 10.34, there's a verse about how they endured their property being confiscated. And so it's likely that either um, Jews were angry at them for abandoning the Jewish law and worshiping Christ, and and then that's the reason why they had their property confiscated. Uh, if, you, if you don't worship the one that we tell you to worship, then you don't get to have property. That's kind of what was going on. But they endured that. And so the author continues to encourage them through these hard times. And, and he starts off, uh, one, one of the themes in this passage is, is that they need to remember that they are, they're part of a house. That they're not alone. Uh, if you ever read or watched Harry Potter, you know that there are these four houses at Hogwarts that a witch or wizard can belong to. There's, there's Gryffindor for the brave people, Ravenclaw for the smart people, Slytherin for the evil people, and Hufflepuff for the people that we don't know what to do with. So there's those four houses, but they're, they're not really physical houses. They're, they're like groups. They're, they're groups of people. They're families. And, and they, they stay in this one family or this one group throughout their whole time at the school, and they go through the good times together, and they go through the hard times together and all that. Um, but we have something like that, only way better. We are part of a house. We might call it a, a covenant community. And this covenant community has God as its father. We have God as our father. Just think about that. God, the creator of the whole universe, is our father. And, and Jesus Christ, our savior, is also our older brother. And we have the Holy Spirit, who is our counselor and our comforter, And we have many, many brothers and sisters. You know that the church, the body of Christ, is is the most diverse group in the world like ever? I mean, there is nothing that can be as diverse 
as the body of Christ because there are people from literally every country, every language, every race, part of the body of Christ, united by Christ. Nothing else can have that kind of diversity and that kind of unity. So we are a family. We're this covenant community. We're a we're family with, with a heavenly calling, as the, as the author says. And that's not, don't hear that as like, okay, we just, we just focus on heaven and we don't worry about right now. Okay, that's not what this is saying. What it's saying is, yes, focus on heaven, focus on your future with Christ, but also let that shape how you live right now. That's what this heavenly calling is. It's kind of both. And so what does that look like? Well, there's... I mean, that's, that's the whole Bible. That's what it looks like. But what do we focus on? And so the, the thing that he wants us to focus on here is he wants us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. We are a family that's urged to fix our thoughts on Jesus. The Greek word here for fix our thoughts is, is kataneo. And think about this. When, when Jennifer and I, um, early on in our marriage, we would have these conversations about the ways that men and women think differently, right? And and sometimes she would catch me sort of staring off intently at something. And she'd be like, wow, he must be in deep thought about something just really complex. And I'd be staring out the window. She'd be like, honey, what are you thinking about? I'd be like, grass. <laughs> and she can't, she can't comprehend how I'm, I'm just, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just fixating, Okay. And that's, so, so he wants us to fixate on something, but not mindless fixation, like, like I like to do. No, this, this is purposeful fixation. This is to consider Jesus attentively. So how do we do that? Well, we need to be in the Bible, and not just, not just reading through the Bible, but to meditate on Scripture. I want to be, be clear, when we say meditate in the Christian tradition, we're not talking about emptying our minds. We're talking about filling our minds with God's word. It's not, you know, go into the, the yoga pose and do namaste. That's not meditation in, in a Christian tradition. This is to fill your mind with the thoughts of God, with the, with the word of God. Uh, so we take a passage. We, we focus on a small passage, maybe one like this. Only six verses. We, fo- we focus on it. We consider the main idea and the, and the actions and the, and the commands and, and the ways that maybe God is, is speaking directly to you through this word. We don't breeze through it. We linger on it. We, we pray over it. Maybe we even pray the, the words themselves. We occupy ourselves with God's word. John Piper when he talks about doing Bible study this way, he calls it um, mining for diamonds. You, you linger over a text long enough, gaze at it enough, you, you tend to start to find diamonds, treasure. This, this is the why. This is why we do this, because the diamond or the treasure is knowing Jesus. This is how we know Jesus. The primary way we know Jesus is through God's word. Think about this. If I, if I want to come to know you better, I got to start with you, right? You, you got to tell me things about you. If I come and I have preconceived ideas about what you're like, then two things are going to happen. One, I'm probably going to be wrong. And two, I've, I've kind of disrespected you. Because I've like started to make up my mind about who you are already before even actually getting to know you. So no, we, we start with the person. And then that means we need to especially be careful to do that with God. We start with what God has said already to us about himself. There, there's a lot of danger, a lot of danger in, in saying things like, well, the Jesus that I know would never fill in the blank. Or... Well, I think Jesus is fill in the blank. That's not always wrong, but dangerous. Because if we're not careful, we start to find that Jesus looks a lot like us. 
suits our preferences and, and suits our desires, the things that we want. And then what can happen is we start to look for other messages that, that fit our preferences. And this is why Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.3, he says, The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. This, this, is, this is, a, is a lot of the American church. <laughs> we find teachers that say what we want to hear, and we listen to those teachers. Friends, we have to go back to God's word. We don't start, when we want to know who Jesus is, and we want to fix our thoughts on Jesus, we've got to start with what Jesus says about himself. And that means we start with Scripture. We let Scripture shape our thoughts and in the messages that, that we communicate. And we have a family. Remember, we're part of a house. We're part of a family. We have a covenant community. And part of being in this community is to help each other keep ourselves focused on the treasure, on Jesus. So maybe, maybe as we talk about Bible study, this intimidates you. I know for a lot of people, this is just, wow, there's so much. There's 66 books, and there's so many big words, and I don't get it. And so you feel overwhelmed, and you just never even know how to start. Well, I want to give you two resources that I think can be really, really helpful uh, with, with helping us understand the big picture of the Bible. One, both, both of these, you can find them on YouTube. Um, if you go on YouTube and just search the Bible Project, Okay, these guys have created these videos that are like illustrations, and they talk through what each book of the Bible is about. There's one for every book of the Bible. So you could go on there, and you could spend seven or eight minutes, and you could get a good overview of what each book is about, and that will help you know how to read it better. The other is called God's Big Picture, which is a book by this guy, Vaughn Roberts. We did this in uh, adult Sunday school back in the fall, and uh, it's a it's a series of videos that helps you understand the this overall story of Scripture. What does it mean from Genesis to Revelation? How does it all link together? How does it all point to Christ? I would, I would encourage you to go check these resources out. They're, I mean, they're videos, so it doesn't take as much work. And, and you can watch them on your, your break or your spare time, whatever. Um, but this is a way that I think that you can feel more equipped if you struggle if you feel overwhelmed with Bible reading, get more equipped and, and learn what these books are about so they can help you know what to do when you're reading them. But there is so much. There's so much that we can fix our eyes on, and, and the author of Hebrews wants us to fix our eyes on specific things about Jesus. And in verse 1 he says, to focus on Jesus who is our apostle and our high priest. And that's our, our second point is that we are a family built by the word and the work of Jesus. So you might be thrown off here by, by the, uh, the author calling Jesus an apostle. Like I thought that the apostles were the 12 disciples, those guys, those fishermen and tax collectors that Jesus gathered together and then sent off, and we read about them in the book of Acts. Well, the Greek word apostle, it really just means sent one or messenger, almost like angel, it's, a, it's someone who is a representative of God speaking to men, or men and women. So Jesus, with, with the 12 apostles, Jesus gave them authority, and he said, go out and speak the words of God as a representative of God to mankind. That's what they did. That's why they were the 12 apostles, and this text is saying that Jesus does this in a much greater way, because he doesn't just speak God's words. He is God's word. Jesus is the word incarnate. That's what John 1.14 says. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, he, he is, the messenger is the message. That's the whole point here. He's different from all other apostles because he's speaking for himself. He's representing himself as God. Um, and he's greater than any other apostle, including Moses. So the author does this whole thing here uh, in verses 2 through 5 where he starts comparing Jesus to Moses. He's like, 
let's, let's set them up. We'll write up, you know, columns, Jesus on one side, Moses on the other. We'll see how Jesus is better in every way. And he starts off by comparing how they're, Jesus is a better apostle, all right? So Moses was also a kind of apostle. We don't really think of him that way. We think more prophet, but he was a messenger, a, a representative of God. So like God comes to him and says, hey, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. What does Moses do? He gets Aaron to go do his dirty work. <laughs> but actually he's there too. So in a way, Moses is, is a representative of God. And then later on, he goes up to Mount Sinai, gets the commandments, comes back down, tells the people, here's the commandments. He does it twice because they, he broke them and stuff. But so, so all of this makes Moses a kind of apostle. And the text says that he was a faithful apostle. He, he, was, he was not perfect, but he was faithful. God gives him high praise. And in fact, the Jewish community gave him probably even higher praise. Right? So they, they kind of worshipped this guy a little bit, or at least they worshipped the law of Moses. This is what they designed their whole lives around. But he's not the point. The author is saying, no, Moses is not the point. He was just like a, like a caretaker of the house. He, he didn't build the house. So why would anybody ever worship Moses? But they did. A lot of the Jews, a lot of the early Jewish Christians still worship Moses. They, they would say it's you know, it's Jesus and the law of Moses. It's Jesus and eating kosher. It's Jesus and doing the, the ritual washings. It's Jesus and observing the Sabbath strictly. Don't, don't even, like, walk five steps on the Sabbath. You got to do that. So, like, we get to Galatians, and this is what Paul is dealing with in the whole book of Galatians. And he says in Galatians 3.1, he's like, Galatians, who has bewitched you that you believe such things? It's not Jesus plus something else. It's just Jesus. It is Jesus and nothing else. There's no add-on. But what add-ons do we have? What do we add on to this? Do we say, to be a Christian, you have to believe in Jesus and read your Bible and pray every single day? Is that, is that an add-on that we do? To be a Christian, you've got be, to believe in Jesus and be uh, a, a woke social... So, I, can't, I can't speak, sorry. A woke social justice warrior. Or, or you got to believe in Jesus and be a Republican. I mean, these are things that we, maybe we wouldn't say that we believe that, but we sort of practice it. But no, there is, there's no and after Jesus. It's just Jesus. We are a covenant community that is united together by one message, by one word, the word of God, Jesus Christ. But what about his work? And this is where we focused on him being the high priest the high priest, of course, was the, the guy that would one day a year go into the most holy place of the tabernacle and then later on the temple and would offer up the sacrifice for all the people. And, and a, just like you know, an apostle is God's representative to man, the high priest is man's representative to God. So he's going before God and he's saying, Here, here's the sacrifice on behalf of all the people. I offer it to you. But he had to do this every single year. And again here, the author compares Jesus to Moses. He's saying Moses was a kind of high priest, too. We think of Aaron as the first actual high priest, but Moses, he was doing priestly stuff before it was cool. Like, he went up on Mount Sinai, right? And the, while he was up there, you know this story in Exodus 32, the people are bored, and they're like, where's Moses? I don't know, let's make a golden calf and worship it. And that's what they did. And, they're, and even Aaron, when he explains it, he's like, I don't know what happened. We just put some gold in there and burned it up, and it, out came a calf. Like, okay, that's, that sounds like something my kid would say. But Moses comes back down, and he sees all this, and, and God is mad, right? God is like jealous, mad. Get out of the way, Moses. I'm going to destroy them. And what does Moses do? He's like, no, 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 please, God, think about your glory, and think about what all the other nations will say if you destroy your people. And God's like, fine, I relent. Okay. So Moses pleads on Israel's behalf. He is Israel's representative before God, so he's a high priest. But he was no Jesus. He was no Jesus. The only thing Moses could do would, was plead. Plead for God to be merciful. God, please, show mercy. And then it was up to God. Because he's a sinner, just like us, right? 
Moses was just a dude. He was just a sinner who happened to be someone that God used in a mighty way. Same thing with Aaron and all the other high priests. They were sinners. They had to go into the most holy place every single year to offer sacrifices continually. Every time they offered a sacrifice, it was like, okay, that's good for this year. You're going to have to do it again next year. Just temporary fixes that were all pointing ahead to the great high priest, to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, you see, is the, is the sinless, perfect high priest. And when he goes before God, he doesn't just offer a sacrifice, he actually is the sacrifice. He himself is the perfect, final sacrifice. There are no more sacrifices necessary now because Jesus has atoned for our sin once for all. And so now that he has risen from the dead and now that he is in glory, you know what he's doing right now? He's interceding for us. Every prayer that we pray goes directly to Jesus and Jesus is telling that prayer to the Father. And, and we have the Holy Spirit inside us in our hearts that the Bible says when we don't even know what to pray, the Holy Spirit's praying on our behalf. How cool is that? This is a, this is a family that is united by Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's amazing. So we don't need continual works to keep ourselves in God's good graces. We don't need to keep sacrificing over and over again. And we don't need to go before God and explain ourselves like, well, here's why you should keep on being merciful towards me because God has God's already got that explanation. Jesus has already explained all that. He's already taken care of all that. But I, I keep thinking about my son, my four-year-old Isaac, who whenever he wants something, he just talks you into it. Like, literally, there is, the kid will never take no for an answer. And I, I feel like I'm a horrible parent because I always end up saying yes to him about everything. But like, the kid just doesn't give up. He just keeps on and on. And it's so cute and maddening at the same time. But he's really, I think he's probably going to be a lawyer because he's just so good at pleading his case. We don't need to do that. <laughs> we can rest. We can rest and know that Jesus has pled our case before the Father and that we are included in the covenant community just because of what Jesus has done. So he is, as verse 6 says, he is the faithful son over God's house. He's done it all. He's built the house. He maintains the house. And he's going to complete the house. And yet, at the very end of this passage in verse 6, we get a really sort of a confusing statement. It's kind of like a, a curveball where it seems like he's saying, but there's a condition here. Right? It says, you know, we're, we're part of his house if we indeed hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So you might read that as, if I don't hold firmly to the confidence and the hope that I have, then I'm going to be removed from the family. That's, a, that's an easy way to read that. Almost like we're, we're saying, I've got to stay confident, and I've got to stay hopeful, or else I'm at risk of being, being cut, being relegated below the Premier League. But the Bible is very clear. Salvation is, is in Christ. It's by, by grace through faith in Christ alone. It's not due to our keeping on obeying the law. So Romans 3.20 makes this very clear. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. That's it. No one. Period. It's by faith. Salvation is not conditional on anything we do. So what does this mean? What I think this means is that we are a family designed to persevere. This is the doctrine of perseverance. It's Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God has begun this work in you and God's going to finish this work in you. He is going to do it. So if we truly belong to the family of God, if we're truly in the covenant community, here, here is a, a characteristic about us. 
We will persevere to the end in faith. That, that's, that is a trait that God has given us. What about people, though, who fall away? You hear, there's been a lot of like, celebrity Christians who have come out and said, I'm not a Christian anymore. What about them? How do we deal with that? Well, I would suggest read 1 John chapter 2, which talks about this. It says that anybody who appears to be a believer in Christ but then falls away, the reason they fell away is because they were not actually a believer in Christ. So how do we know that someone is 100% for sure a believer in Christ? It's because they die a Christian. That's, the, that's actually the most sure way to know. They persevere to the end as a believer. Will we have struggles? Will we have seasons of doubt? Will we have seasons where we're like, God, where are you? Yeah, <laughs> of course. But Jesus is going to bring us back because the promise of John 10, I, I love John 10, 28 and 29. He says, I give, he's talking about his sheep, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So if you belong to Jesus and you belong to the Father, and you have the Holy Spirit, you are secure. It's sealed. No one will snatch you or me out of their hands. So our confidence and our hope, these are not conditions that we must maintain to, in order to keep our salvation up, but they are characteristics of having salvation. They're characteristics of knowing Jesus. So it's just like, think of it like this. Again, we talked about the Harry Potter houses, right? If you're a Gryffindor, you're brave. If you're a Ravenclaw, you're smart. If you're a Hufflepuff, you're just kind of there. And if you're Slytherin, you're evil, right? You get into those houses based on those traits, but with, but with God's house... We don't get into the house based on anything. We get into the house because of Jesus, and then Jesus gives us these characteristics, these fruits, and, and those fruits are going to be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They're also going to include things like having supernatural confidence and hope. But they're supernatural, so they're not things that we muster up. They're, they're gifts that God gives us. And then what happens is, as we move along through life, I think, I think this is how it works. We have this ability that's given to us where we can supernaturally be confident and hopeful, and then we see Jesus continually be faithful in the big things and the small things, and we encourage one another daily as, as family members, and guess what happens? We grow in our confidence and our hope. But there's still ups and downs. I mean, after all, why else would the author of Hebrews write this passage if there are not still ups and downs, crazy stuff happening. Like, for us, a pandemic, people playing political games with the pandemic, people causing fear and growing disheartened over the state of our country and, and, and just seeing the, all of the racial tension and hearing the stories of, of what African Americans have lived through and just feeling so brokenhearted because of that and then then you've got the economy, and you're seeing, you're seeing the, the GDP down like crazy this quarter and starting to lose hope maybe that it's never going to be the same. And, and then, I don't know if you keep up with this, but the church, I mean, as, as church leaders, we, we are more and more concerned about what our future is going to look like in this country. Will we continue to have freedom to worship God the way we believe the Bible teaches and that's not even to mention personal trials that you may be going through. Maybe all of that has happened on top of a very, very intense time of personal tragedy or, or just depression or anxiety. There, this is a lot, a lot to put on a family all at once. Please see the connection, though. This is, I need to see this. Our confidence and our hope, or the lack thereof, are directly tied to what we're fixing our thoughts on. If you are fixing your thoughts on Fox News or CNN, you're not going to have confidence and hope. You're going to have fear and dread. If you're fixing your thoughts on your friend's social media posts, you're not going to have confidence and hope. You're going to have depression and anxiety, and you may have China spying on you. If you are 
fixing your thoughts on yourselves. If I'm fixing my thoughts on myself, I'm not going to have confidence and hope. I'm going to have shame and despair. Because all I'm going to see is my failures and my sin. What are we fixing our thoughts on? It must be Jesus, first and foremost. I'm not saying you can never think about yourself or never go on social media or never watch the news. I'm saying, what are you fixing your thoughts on? What are you occupying your mind with? Jesus is the message. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus is the end of fear and the end of dread and the end of anxiety and the end of shame, the end of despair. We of all people, friends, we of all people have reason to be hopeful and confident in this time. We of all people have the ability to encourage one another in this time because we're a covenant community united by Jesus and nothing can, nothing can separate us from him. And the result is that we can have a greater joy. So there's a guy named Jason Cook, who's a youth pastor, who said, hope is borrowing the joy of tomorrow. And what is our tomorrow if we're Christians? Our tomorrow is that we will live with Jesus for all of eternity in a perfect world. That's our tomorrow. That's going to bring us unspeakable joy. Can we borrow that joy for today? If we can borrow that joy for today, then we cannot just endure 2020, we can flourish in 2020. Because it's not about the circumstances going on in 2020, it's about Jesus and fixing our thoughts on him. Let's fix our thoughts on Jesus and watch as our confidence and our hope grow, even in a world where everything else seems like it's falling apart. Let's pray.